Hi, I'm Corey Orthman. I'm back with another webinar. I'm a middle school math teacher in addition to other subjects, and today we're going to be working on math. And I am Torben Hansen. I'm an upper school math teacher, and I will be assisting with this webinar. Yeah, so we both teach math here at the Delphian School, uh, in addition to some other subjects. And we both really like the subject of math, and we wanted to help you guys out today with math word problems. So uh, very first thing, everyone at home, if you don't already have it in front of you, go get some blank paper or lined paper and a pencil. Not a pen, you have to have a pencil. <laughs> so run and grab that right now. And we're gonna talk about some of our goals for this webinar today while you go and do that. So the reason that we're doing word problems specifically today and strategies for solving them is in my experience, my students often tell me that word problems are like the trickiest thing that they deal with. Yeah, exactly. And in my experience with our school students, uh, by the time they get to our school, they have the basics done really well. But the moment you throw them an application problem, they still like, go, well, <laughs> what are we doing now? So it's a good thing to have that skill. Yeah. So there are some specific uh, tips that we're going to give you today that really make solving word problems a lot easier, um, make it not such a upsetting problem yes, <laughs> to solve math. them. Because math is fun. Yeah, yeah. So, great. So the first thing I wanted to talk to you all about is that math is actually its own language. And that's probably the first problem people run into is up to the point that you do word problems, you've just been solving you know, basic addition problems, basic subtraction problems, et cetera. But then once you start getting these like paragraphs of English words that have math you know, and numbers mixed in, yeah. it can get a little bit confusing. The problem actually is, is that you have two languages at the same time. You're, you're working with the language of English and the language of math, and they're all jumbled together. That's right. So my first tip for everyone at home is to recognize that the first thing you need to do when solving a word problem is figure out how you're going to convert the, all these English words mm -hmm. into a math problem. Yeah. Because you're already good at solving you know, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division problems, hopefully. Uh, and you just have to figure out which one of those things that you're doing when you wow. solve a word problem. Yeah, it's a little bit like uh, learning a new language, mm -hmm. uh, like Spanish or Danish, uh, in my case, uh, <laughs> except for the kind of stuff we're looking at here, the language only have four basic letters mm -hmm. or words, mm -hmm. two, two words. And the rest of it is English. Mm -hmm. You just have to be able to plug it in and extract it out and translate it from one to the other. Yeah, those four basic tools that you're gonna be using in word problems uh, in math, we call them operations. The four operations are you're going to add things together. You can subtract things. You can multiply numbers or you can divide numbers. And we just call those operations. They're the four things you can do. As complicated as any word problem seems in math, you just remember it's going to be one of these four operations or maybe more than one of those operations. But Still, it'll be one of them or a combination of those. Okay, so I hope everyone's back and has a uh, pencil and paper. And we're gonna start working through a few word problems together. And then after we've solved a few problems together, uh, we're gonna give you a few problems that you can do at home. And when you're ready to try to solve a problem like you think you have the answer, look for the Q&A box on the bottom of your screen and you can type the answer to the problem in there. Also, if you have a question, type that into the Q&A box. Uh, there's a few other things you can do. Uh, there's a, um, like a raise hand feature, there's a chat feature. Don't use those. Any questions or anything you wanna tell us, just put it in the Q&A box. That's the best place for that. So, all right, we're gonna go to our, um, our first problem here. All right, so this problem, I scored 27 points in our first basketball game, and I scored 15 points in our second game. 
how many points did I score altogether? So before we start doing anything with this word problem, here are the basic things we need to think about. Step one, the first thing you need to ask yourself is, what is the actual question here? The fact that this is talking about a basketball game isn't the most important piece of information. The most important piece of information is that it's saying, how many points did I score all together? That word means when you take more than one thing and you put them together, how many do you have overall? And that word there all together is a clue that you're gonna be adding. So of your four basic operations that you have, you know when you look at this word problem that it's an addition problem. You're gonna take this number of points, 27 points, and you're gonna add it to 15 points to get your answer. So Torben's gonna to go ahead and do that up on the board really quick. 27 points. What was the other one, 24? And 15 points. 15 points. All right, so we agreed that was addition. So we have to add these. Uh, five plus seven, 12. Why not? One, two, three, four. 42 points. All right, let's see if Torben was correct. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. 42 points was correct. Good job, Torben. <laughs> so what he did there was he first asked, what is the question? The question was how many points altogether? And then he decided that addition was the correct operation out of our four operations to use. And then he did the actual math problem where he was turning all those English words in the paragraph into just a simple addition problem. So the next thing to know about a word problem is in addition to just asking yourself, what's the question here? Um, the next step is spotting that sometimes there's going to be extra information in a problem that we don't need yeah. and that there's some information that you can just ignore. And also that sometimes there's going to be more than one step to a word problem. Sometimes you're going to need to do more than one thing to get to the answer. So in our next problem, Last week was John's birthday. He already had $120 in his savings account and he was given $50 for his birthday. If he spends $60 on a new video game, how much money does he have left? Okay, so the first thing that we can spot here is what is the question? What is it asking? We can kind of ignore everything else for a second and just see that at the end of the question it says, how much money does he have left? Those words there, how much is left, that's a clue that we're probably gonna be doing a subtraction problem. Yeah. When something's asking how much you have left, it's usually because you took an amount away. And that says to me, subtraction, yeah. taking something away. But there's a couple trickier things in this word problem. First, it gives us some bonus information that we don't really need. It says, last week was John's birthday, okay. <laughs> That's great to know, but it isn't actually going to help us solve the math problem. So we can go ahead and ignore that sentence. All right. So the next part here, it says that John had $120 in his savings account and he was given $50 for his birthday. So the second thing we have to spot here is, okay, the, the end part of it, the question, it's asking how much we have left. But this first part, it looks like they're asking us to put some amounts together. Mm -hmm. So what we have to spot is that we actually have more than one step in this word problem. We actually have an addition problem and then we have a subtraction problem. So the amounts were $120 in the savings account and he was given $50 for his birthday. And then if he spends $60 on a new video game, how much money does he have left? Torben's gonna go ahead and solve this problem. All right, so let's first see how much we have. So we have to add he already had 120. He gets another 50, so we add those together. Zero plus zero is zero. Five plus two is seven. One. So he has $170 before he starts buying video games. Then he subtracts 
the price of a video game, which in this case is $60. Okay, zero, zero, zero. Six from seven is one, and zero from one is one. So he should have $110 left. All right, let's check our answer here. Torben said $110. If anybody else is following along at home, let's see what we get. The answer was $110. Good job, Torben. <laughs> and good job anybody at home that had $110. If you got a different number, you can go ahead and check your work. You can look at again, 120 added to 50 gave us $170. And then we took away $60, which was the price of the video game. And that gave us 110. All right. So remember the basic steps again that we're going to do is one, what is the question being asked in the word problem? Yeah. Two, is there any additional information that we can ignore? That's not going to help us solve it. Um, then three, spot what kind of operation are we going to have to use? Um, is it addition, subtraction, multiplication, or division? And then lastly, sometimes there's going to be more than one operation needed to solve that problem. Yeah. The birthday doesn't really help us solve the problem. <laughs> it's cute, but it's just information. Yeah. It just makes the problem a little bit more fun. Yeah. All right. So we're going to go through a few more problems together here. The next one is seven gallons of water come out of a hose in one minute. How many gallons come out in one hour? So another little note I want to give you here, you'll notice that in this word problem, there aren't even any uh, numbers written. They're actually written out as English words. The word seven, uh, the word one, they're just written out as English words, they don't use the numerals or the math symbols for the numbers here. That can be something else that can sometimes be a little bit tricky in word problems is it might be that the numerals, the math symbols are written, um, but sometimes it'll just be English sentences and you have to spot that. You have a little bit of an extra job to do there, which is figuring out, do all the words in English here, do they need to be changed into their math symbols before we can even do the problem? We have an additional tricky thing here is that we have two different units. We have things mentioned in minutes and things mentioned in hours. Right. So we might actually, you know, somebody might need to check or you might need to look up or ask somebody if you forget, like, wait, how many minutes are there in an hour? That's actually an additional piece of information you need to solve this problem. Yeah. Um, so we know that there are 60 minutes in one hour. That's the first piece of information that we're going to need to solve this. Now, step one, what's the question being asked here? How many gallons of water are coming out of this hose in an hour? Um, there's not actually a lot of extra information in here. There wasn't any information about the color of the hose or the fact that it's summer. There wasn't anything else like that that was going to trip us up. So we can just jump into figuring out what kind of a problem is this? Corbin, what kind of problem do you think this is? Well, we have seven gallons in one minute. And then we have 60 minutes because we have an hour. Mm -hmm. So seven gallons in one minute, 60 minutes. Sounds like multiplication to me. Yeah. Go ahead. All right. So seven gallons in one minute and 60 minutes, so we're multiplying. So times 60, so let's be smart about how we write this. So <laughs> 60 times seven. I noticed that you're writing the bigger number on top in this multiplication problem, because yes. it's usually easier to put the bigger number on top, right? Exactly. Uh, seven times zero is zero. Seven times six is 42. And so we should get 420 gallons in one hour. All right, let's check our answer here. Uh, 
Let's see if Torben was right. He was 420 gallons. Good job, Torben. Yay. I've noticed also that some of our participants in the Q&A section have started uh, writing answers in here. So let's see what some of our participants have said. McKenna said 420. Good job. Ella said 420. Good job, Ella. Ariana said 420 gallons per one hour. Great. Oliver said 420. Um, another guest here said 420. It looks like most everybody got 420. Um, one of the attendees here has a great question. It says, do you always have to write the unit? I'm going to say, I think yes. And here's why. Uh, with word problems, when you have several sentences or a whole paragraph asking a question, it might be like in this problem, we're dealing with time and we're dealing with like amounts of water. Maybe it'll be talking about summer or a birthday or something else. If we just say 420, it might be confusing as to what we're saying. Um, I've seen students get to the end of a word problem like this and they write something like 420 minutes. <laughs> and that's understandable. And that's why it's actually really important at the beginning to go back and your step one is what is the question I'm trying to answer here? Because if you remember that the question was how many gallons of water are coming out, yeah. and at the end of the problem, you go back and you, you check that, that first question, which was how many gallons of water, you won't make that mistake of writing down 420 minutes, or you won't make the mistake of just saying 420 with no words. Because your math teachers, us, we're going to want to see that unit written. We're going to want to see what thing we're counting. Yeah. I think the, the really important thing, the other important thing, reason to do this is because math is for real life. Yeah. Uh, math is for application. When you grow up and you're using math in real life, um, I can't just go up to somebody and say 420. They're going to go like, what are you talking about? Yeah. I might need to tell somebody if I'm trying to paint a room, and I'm going to the store to buy paint, I need to be able to, after I'm done with all my math and calculating how much paint I need, I would need to tell somebody, I need 420 gallons of paint. Right. That's a lot of paint, but you get it. <laughs> uh, the unit is like, it's the real life part of the math that you're doing. Yeah. So great question, thank you for that. And it's one of the things that is, uh, one of the biggest differences between middle school and upper school math is that when we get to the upper school, we start paying a lot more attention to the units. It's no longer like an elementary school. It's enough to say 60 times seven mm -hmm. and no context. In middle school, we start to get the context. Yeah. So we have to think with it. In upper school, it's absolutely essential. Yeah. So. Yeah, awesome. All right, let's move on to our next problem. In one month, a pilot flew his plane 17, oh, we have a typo here, sorry about that. A pilot flew her plane 17,570 miles. If she flew her plane 14 times, how many miles was each trip on average? Okay, so breaking this down again, the first question was, or the, the important question was, how many miles was each of these trips? There were 14 trips overall, and how many miles were each of them on average? That's our first really important clue. When a question is asking about how much were things on average, that means, you know, in real life, each one of those trips might have been a different length but we're taking a whole lot of um, question. We're taking a whole lot of amounts of distances traveled. Mm -hmm. We're going to this 17,570. They were all put together. And now we're trying to find out like about how big each one was when you kind of even them all out. Right. That's an average. So the clue there, when it says average, that tells me this is a division problem. Yeah. We're taking a whole big amount of something and we're going to break it down. It says this whole amount of miles and there were 14 trips. 
So we're gonna break that big amount into 14 even parts. Right. That's division, right? Exactly. Okay, good. So Torben's gonna go ahead and try to solve this problem. Okay, 14 into 17,570. All right, 14 goes into 17 one time. All right, 14 here, subtract, three, pull down the five, 14 into 35, I'd say two times. Two times 14, 28. Subtract, seven. All right, 14 into 77. Okay, so now we're getting into, well, we'll probably have to guess a little bit here, but if I say five, then we're probably gonna be close. Let's see. Uh, 27, okay. Is that right? Mm -hmm. All right, so good. Then one more time, uh, I guess that's another five. Oh, and bingo, it actually goes <laughs> in. I was getting bored right there, but yeah, be good. <laughs> Good job. All right, let's check our answer here and let's see if Torben got the right answer. <laughs> Each trip was 1,255 miles. Good job, Torben. See, I have the easy part. I'm just, I just get to ask the questions. Torben has to uh, actually solve them here on the board in real time. <laughs> uh, he has the harder job. All right, great. Uh, I'm going to check the Q&A and see what some of our participants said. All right. So Ariana said 1,255 miles per trip. Good job. And thank you for including the unit there. Hartley said the answer is 1,255 miles. Good job. Ella and Olivia both said 1,255. Very good job. Make sure you include the unit though. Um, let's see, um, this participant wanted to make sure we said their name correctly. Gaia three, Gaia three. All right. That's a great name. I've never heard that name before. Uh, Gaia three said 1,255 miles. Good job. And Olivia jumped back in here and included the unit. Thank you, Olivia. <laughs> Good job guys. Everybody got that one, right? And again, when you're doing the units, the units is basically the same thing as a problem. Mm -hmm. So it was miles divided by trips. Mm -hmm. So the unit becomes miles per trip. Miles per trip. All right, awesome. Great, let's move to the next problem. All right, so so far we've done some addition, we've done some subtraction. Uh, that time we had to do some division. Let's see what happens next. All right, this one's actually gonna be a do at home problem. We're giving you the problem here and we're gonna give you a couple minutes. This one might be a little bit easy. We wanted the first do at home problem to not be too difficult. Uh, if 38 people each carried 17 boxes into a building, how many boxes were taken into the building? We're gonna give you just a minute or two to solve that problem. Go ahead. While you guys are working on that problem, we have a question here from Elijah. He asks, do you have to write the unit more than once in some questions? That's a great question. I find that as I am working on a problem, I do like to uh, include the unit as I'm going through it. Yeah. Um, I find, you know, when it says 38 people, each person has 17 boxes. I find that if I, don't include the units, I can forget what the different numbers are actually referring to. Um, I would suggest when doing word problems that you should definitely keep the how many people, how many boxes, 
whatever else important information you have. Again, uh, you don't have to write down that it's somebody's birthday. <laughs> That's probably not going to be important to the math. Right. And especially like when we're only talking about two things to keep track of and we're doing one operation on it, then yeah. we probably could do it in our head, remember what is it we're talking about. Yeah. But it's good practice because mm -hmm. when you get to upper school, you're going to get problems where you're going to multiply two things and then you're going to add it to something else and mm -hmm. you then end up dividing it by something else and then you have to do something else and then you get the height of the Empire State Building at the end of that. <laughs> and it's like, what was the unit? Right. Because maybe you multiplied some feet with some inches somewhere along the way and suddenly your unit is very strange. Right. So. Okay, great. So 38 people each carried 17 boxes into a building. How do we solve this problem, Torben? I would say each person carries 17 and mm -hmm. there's 38 of them. So that must be multiplication. Because mm -hmm. we're going to be taking an amount and basically adding itself to itself a certain number of times. Yeah. Great. So we could write 17, 38 times and add it, but that's mm -hmm. a lot of work. That would take a lot of time. would be a lot easier. <laughs> Do we have some answers? Uh, yeah, but you go ahead and solve it and then we'll, we'll see what our viewers said. Okay. So you're multiplying the 38 by the seven first. Yeah, so seven times eight is 56. Seven times three is 21 plus five is 26. Then always remember some people put an X there, some put a zero there. We can do mm -hmm. both. It doesn't matter what you put there. As long as you put something there to mm -hmm. remember that you're moving across. Great. And then it's one times eight, which is eight. One times three is three. And then we add it all together. Six, 14, and six. Okay. So what unit should we put at the end there next to 646? Well, it's people boxes. <laughs> Technically. But so, basically, we have this many people moving boxes. So we really we're having boxes. Sometimes we have to, if I was being really super technical, it mm -hmm. would be people boxes, but <laughs> it's boxes. We, we can see that. Awesome. All right, let's check our answer here and see what it says. 646 boxes were carried into the building. Good job, Torben. Well done. <laughs> All right, let's see what our participants at home said. So, uh, one attendee said the answer is 646. Good job. Um, remember, as we just talked about, it's a good idea to include the unit there. Ariana said 646 boxes total. Good job, Ariana. Uh, Sophia said 646 boxes. Well done. Olivia, Ella, both said 646 boxes. Good job. Um, Gayathri said 304 boxes. Well, that's a little bit under half the number of boxes. So um, while, while, while we go that through a few- be because they forgot to put the zero there. That makes sense. If you add the 38 to that, you get 300 and something. Well, there you go. It looks like we just need to put in the zero there, move that over, and your answer would have been totally right. So good job on that part. Uh, Ariana asks, do you subtract points for not including the units? Well, at our school, when we're doing math problems like this, we don't really, when you're doing math, we don't grade you or give points or not. Our actual, our method of teaching when we're going through math problems like this We'll give you a whole set of math problems to do. And after you finish them, if you get anything wrong, we actually go back and we just help you spot, just like we did with that answer. We try to actually spot why you got the math problem wrong and help you fix it, help you spot you know, what piece of knowledge might be missing. And then you go through and you fix anything you got wrong and you do some more practice because we actually like to end off any um, class of like math practice with everybody in the class getting everything totally understood. So we don't ever actually subtract points. 
Uh, we'd rather just make sure you understand the math. <laughs> right. All right. Um, another attendee here said 646. Good job. Um, there we go. Fiafri said 646. Good job. Um, all right. Okay, let's move on to our next problem. All right, so this is your next do at home problem. My brother lives almost a thousand miles away in Los Angeles. That's a true story, by the way. More than one brother lives in Los Angeles. If he has lived in the, his house for 108 months, how many years has he lived in his house? Okay, again, so my brother lives almost a thousand miles away in Los Angeles. If he has lived in his house for 108 months, how many years has he lived in his house? I'm gonna give you guys a couple minutes to go ahead and solve. All right, Torben, so walk us through how you would solve this problem. Well, first I would look at that one year is actually 12 months. Mm -hmm. And we have to figure out how many years, uh, so we have to figure out how many times do we have 12 months in this amount. So that sounds like a division problem. So I'm gonna go ahead and do a division problem here. And looks like I have to guess it right the first time. So let's go <laughs> by, I'm gonna guess nine. Nine times two is 18. Uh, that doesn't go there, it goes there. And nine plus one is 10. That looks promising. Nine months. Nine months? Uh, nine years. <laughs> See? Yeah. Huh? Units are important. Yes, yeah, so that's a good example of, again, the first step is asking yourself, uh, what is the question? What is that question asking? That one said, how many years has he lived in his house? Right. But because we're doing work with months and years, we can forget for a second and we could say nine months and that would be understandable that somebody could make that mistake. Um, the second step, uh, Torben, there's the word a thousand in here, and that's a number. Would you say it's important to know that my brother lives a thousand miles away in Los Angeles? No. So that's that second part of um, having to ask yourself, is there information here that I don't actually need to solve the problem? Uh, we can call that birthday information, maybe. Yes. <laughs> Since our first problem talked about it being somebody's birthday, not applicable to solving the problem here where he lives and how far away he lives didn't have anything to do with solving the problem itself. Right. The only really important information was he's lived in his house for 108 months. There are 12 months in a year. So we know to divide 108 by 12 months and hopefully the right answer is nine years. Let's go ahead and check it. He has lived in his house for nine years. Good job, Torben. I think Torben is like four for four so far. Good job. <laughs> Let's see what some of our participants at home said. All right, so Hartley said nine years. Good job, Hartley. Um, Olivia said nine, which is the right number. Very good job. Uh, just make sure that we're including the unit on there. Uh, Ariana says your brother has lived in his house for nine years total. Very good job. 
Uh, oh, there it is. Olivia said nine years. Her next, she corrected herself. She was like, I need to include the unit. Um, Gayathri says nine years. Very good job. Um, all right. Great job, guys. All right, let's move on to the next problem. All right, so this is our last problem for the day because we're running low on time. This one is a bit trickier, and I'm gonna tell you right off the bat, there are several parts to this problem. There's not just one math problem to solve here. There are several things you have to do to get to the end of this math problem. So I want you to go ahead and take a crack at solving this longer bonus tricky problem. Go ahead. All right, so I know that since this is a bonus trickier problem, it's got a few steps to it. Not everyone maybe is done, but I'm going to let Torben start working on it because he's got to go through all the steps too. So if you're not quite done yet at home, you can race Torben to the finish here. So walk us through the several different parts to solving this word problem. Right, so first thing is Monday to Saturday, I'm having from 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. And then on the Sunday, we have a little bit less. We have 8 a.m., but we want to get home early to watch all our shows on Sunday. So we end off at 6 p.m. Okay, how much time is that each day? Well, 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. So we have to think about this for a second. I like to divide it into like, uh, split it up at 12 o'clock noon. I, in my head, I, I, I first count from 8 a.m. to noon. Right. And then I count from noon to 9 p.m. So 8 a.m. to noon, that gives me four hours. And then from noon to 9 p.m. gives me nine hours. So I'll end up with a total of 13 hours each normal work day. Mm -hmm. On this Sunday, 8 a.m. to 12 gives me four hours. 12 to 6 gives me six hours. So it's a 10-hour workday on the Sunday. Okay. All right. Now, I have one, two, three, four, five, six days. That, that's regular days. So I'll have six days times my 13 hours remember my units here <laughs> all right so that's 18 no it's not yes yeah yeah <laughs> six seven so 78 hours uh for those six days mm -hmm. and then i have the one day with 10 hours so let's add that to that and I'll have 88 hours and that's for one week. So we might think that we're done there, 
we might think that we figured out how many hours we worked in a week. But here's why this problem, we had to do all that work just to figure out how many hours you're working in one week. But part of the reason that this is a trickier problem is that it did ask, how many hours is the store open in four weeks? Right. So what do we have to do at the end of this problem here? So we have to still multiply this by four because this is just for one week. Mm -hmm. So 88 times four, okay, four times eight, 32. And 32 again, plus three, uh, 35. So if all goes well, we'll end up with 352 hours. All right, 352 hours. Let's check our answer here. Torben's been doing pretty good so far. Let's see if he got this last one right. Yeah. The store was open for 352 hours. Good job. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and check some of our answers from our participants. All right, so we did say this was a trickier one right off the bat. We have a few answers that are high here that are up at 432 hours. Um, let's see, Hartley here says 352 hours. Good job, Hartley. Ariana says 400, um, sorry about that. Didn't mean to call you out. Um, Ella Latch says 352 hours. Good job, Ella. So yeah, well done guys. Um, let's see, one participant says, it sounds like they're not sure how we got to that answer. Do you want to walk us through it one more time? Sure. I'm going to put the original question back up on the screen and let's go through it one more time. I think we have a few minutes left. We'll go through it one more time to see what all of the parts were there. Okay, so the original question was, we have a clothing store and it's open from 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. Monday through Saturday. And then one day of the week, it's open from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. So we're trying to figure out first, how long is this store open in one week altogether? And then how long is it gonna be open altogether in four weeks? Right. So let's go through it one more time. Okay, so we start out 8 a.m. Uh, so eight down here. We walk it up to 12. And that gives us one, two, three, four hours there. Mm -hmm. Then we continue around one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, until we get to 9 p.m. So that gave us nine more. So we figured out in, in one day of Monday through Saturday, 8 a.m. to 9 p.m., that was four hours, and then nine hours was 13 hours in one day, yeah. Monday through Saturday. And the Sunday is 4 a.m. Uh, no, it's not. It's 8 a.m. Thank God for that. Um, so 8 a.m. to 12 is still 4. And then down to 6, I'll get 6 hours here. So the Sunday is 10. Then for one week, I'll have... 13 hours here, 13 hours to Tuesday, 13 Wednesday, 13 uh, Thursday, 13 Friday, and 13 on Saturday, and 10 on Sunday. This is six times 13, which is what we did here, which brings us to the 78. Then I have one 10, so we have to add that in. And then we so we figured out that at the end of one week, you yeah. work for 88 hours. Right. But the question asked for how much do you work overall in four weeks? So we have to take the 88 and multiply it with four weeks. And that's where we got the 352 hours. 
So that was a trickier problem, but several of you got that right. So very good job, guys. Um, yeah, so I'm glad that was helpful to sorting that problem out. All right, so I hope this has been helpful today. I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, we're going to be doing more of these word problems later in the week yep. um, and probably next week too. So the plan is on our next, check the schedule. The next time that we're doing word problems, we're going to be doing some slightly more difficult problems. So if anything here today seemed like it was too easy or you solved it too quickly, get ready. Our next one, we're gonna probably get into some fractions. We'll get into some problems that are a little bit more tough. And then who knows, next week we might get up into positive and negative numbers. We might even do some simple algebra. Yeah. So yeah, get ready for that. Stay tuned. Thank you guys for attending today and we will see you next time.